Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you all for coming. Um, for reasons that should be obvious, we're not going to light a fire in the middle of the room here. <laughs> Actually, when Prabhupada came to Gainesville in 1971, Gainesville, Florida, I was a uh, grihasta, temple president, and uh, Prabhupada gave initiation to a number of devotees, including my wife. And uh, the circumstances didn't permit, it wasn't time to do a fire sacrifice, so then Prabhupada did what we're doing here, and then after he left, we, we did the fire sacrifice. So, uh, so I'm going to follow the tradition, a good tradition, and uh, explain, try to explain about what we're doing here. What are we doing here? And... Uh, <laughs> And then after that, we'll, we'll do the actual initiation. Uh, I've explained many times before, but I'll say it one more time, what the word diksha really means. Uh, if we, the word we translate, initiation. If you look in the Bhagavatam, the Srimad Bhagavatam, at how this word is used, it's interesting. Uh, the word diksha is used to indicate a process by which essentially a person is prepared or prepares themselves for an encounter with God. Um, but in the Bhagavatam, these encounters are brief. They are in the context of a ritual fire sacrifice. For example, if you're going to meet a very important person that has power over your life, it could be your boss or whatever it may be, uh, normally you, you know, take a shower, put on clean clothes, get yourself ready, make sure you're decent, and then you go. So it's normal that we prepare ourselves for important encounters and for an encounter with God we not only need clean clothes we also need clean consciousness and so in our daily lives we all get caught up in so many things we have so many duties it's the nature of the world and therefore in the uh, Vedic culture before an important sacrifice in this particular historical context fire sacrifice um, people would take special measures to make sure that when they entered into this divine encounter, because that was the whole point of fire sacrifice, that Agni is sort of the uh, Sanskrit Hermes, you know, the messenger of the gods. So, so the offering is made into the sacred fire. And you find this fire sacrifice all over the ancient world. Um, I mean, not only the Zoroastrians, the ancient Greeks, Romans, it was basically a universal understanding that under certain circumstances, the fire would in fact become an agent of God. And when you offer into the fire, uh, that offering is actually being carried to God. So... Um, Krishna, anyway, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna... I think in chapter 6, he uh, takes the basic components of a fire sacrifice, such as uh, havis, uh, the actual substance that's offered in the fire, havis means ghee, or the fire itself, and, um, and he uses these terms symbolically. Because in Vedic culture, uh, there were people who practiced, uh, you could say, sort of a deep spiritual yoga and meditation, others, and of course, bhakti yoga. And so they didn't actually perform the physical fire sacrifice. Therefore, Krishna says, some yogis uh, use the mind as the fire, and they offer into the mind uh, the sense objects. Some people offer the sense objects into the senses or and so on and so forth. So Krishna gives uh, sort of a list, a survey of all these different 
uh, forms of sacrifice in which the actual physical ingredients are simply symbols. But in any case, uh, the general idea here is that by offering uh, to God, Krishna, uh, one is honoring the Lord. It's just like, in, say, in the Roman Empire, the different countries would pay tribute, or in the Rajasuya sacrifice, uh, the kings from all over the world came and offered tribute to Yudhisthira. So, uh, if you think of how the word tribute is used, like, you know, like they have, I don't know, like a Kennedy Center tribute to uh, Mick Jagger or something. And so the, uh, the idea of a tribute is that you honor somebody. And so the offering is a way of showing that honor. For example, I got myself a, I didn't have to fly to Hawaii to get this, I got a <laughs> flower garland. So, and so the idea is that in this process of offering in the fire, uh, Krishna, God, Vishnu, comes and accepts that offering. In fact, there are many examples in the Bhagavatam where Vishnu actually visibly shows up. He actually appears, manifests himself at the fire sacrifice and personally takes the offering. So, so the fire sacrifice was understood as a, in, in fact, if you study uh, the Vedas, what you find is that the arena of sacrifice, which is not very large, probably not much larger than this room, but and it had to be drawn, it had to have a perimeter in a certain shape. And actually, sometimes in, in grand sacrifices or uh, sort of state sacrifices, not just someone at home, Brahmin at home, but in these solemn state events of royal sacrifices, they would have several fires and, and the area enclosed within that perimeter was actually a microcosm of the universe. I mean, literally a microcosm. It was the universe. And so, by going to the different fires, uh, one was actually traveling across the universe. And there, there's a whole science behind this, the sacrifice. But um, it wasn't just a blind ritual. What do you need? What do you need? Oh. No, oh, I thought you needed Oh, oh, the kettle. Can, can you switch it off? Really yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's all right. Uh, it, it, is that a problem for you? Uh, no. Will it burn? Like, no, no, it's I think the water just keeps evaporating. Oh, oh, yeah, maybe turn it off. We can do that later. Good call. Yeah. So, <laughs> but again, for the purpose of the sacrifice, you see, this. I, I didn't forget the topic due to advanced age. So, <laughs> the relevant point here is that um, in the sacrifice, one has an encounter with God, with Krishna or Vishnu, and therefore, you have to prepare your consciousness. And so the procedure, for example, we have in the Bhagavatam, the Payobrata ceremony, the, the, the milk fast, or the milk, literally the milk vow, Payobrata, where before beginning a child, a, uh, a lady would perform different kinds of austerities to get into the highest possible state of consciousness to get the best possible child. So, that's what Diksha was. Diksha was the procedure, the process by which you, it could be an austerity, it could be a type of fast, it could be various things, chanting mantras, but by which uh, you come to a higher state of consciousness. So you're ready to appropriately meet your maker, so to speak. And, um, now, what happened is that by, of course, as Prabhupada said, Krishna came and taught, but then the world forgot what he taught, so he came again. But over time, there was what you could call in India a bhakti revolution. Uh, you see, for example, the Alvars in southeast India and Tamil Matnadu, uh, Ramanujacharya, who answers Shankara, and then Madhvacharya. And then, of course, finally, the culmination of this revival of bhakti was Lord Chaitanya himself. And so, when one understands the philosophy of bhakti, then you see that the encounter with God, the offering to God, is not merely at an occasional ritual, but actually you have to, it, you have to give your life to God. The offering becomes your life. 
if one is actually serious about uh, reestablishing that eternal relationship with, with Krishna. And so therefore, when the offering becomes your life, and I don't mean this in some horrible cultish way, so it, it simply means that um, you dedicate your life, whatever you do, if you're a doctor, lawyer, or more likely a candlestick maker, <laughs> whatever you do in life, you, um, you devote your life to Krishna, whatever it is you happen to do. So when we understand that the offering is actually one's life, then the diksha is not simply something for a week or two weeks or a month or something. It's actually the diksha initiates you into a purification process for your entire life. So that, so that throughout your life, you carry out the principles of this diksha. So that's a short explanation of why we use that word. Um, diksha or the spiritual initiation is a very special thing because uh, it shows that a person is serious uh, about what they're doing. For example, take sports. I mean, many people, probably most people, occasionally get out in the field and you know, kick a soccer ball around or cricket, something which inconceivably has not caught on in the United States, but you know, hit the, hit the cricket ball or basketball, whatever. You know, every, everyone does some sport. But it's only a small, elite number of people that have the discipline, the determination to become professional athletes. And of course, if one aspires to become a professional athlete, then it's not just going on the weekend and kicking a ball around. It's, it's much more serious. In the same way, for example, you know, maybe a lot of people can sort of, I don't know, bang out a little tune on a keyboard. But to become a serious mus musician is altogether a different project. It requires tremendous discipline, dedication, sacrifice to achieve that level of excellence. And it's true in any field of life. So in the same way, you know, it's very common. People will say, well, I'm not religious, but I'm kind of spiritual. <laughs> Which means that, I don't know, I smile at other people or <laughs> something like that. So, so you know, every, everyone does their occasional good deed or <clears throat> maybe sometimes attends, sometimes attends a spiritual program here or there, wherever, at some center. But initiation means that someone has really taken this up in a serious, disciplined way. That it's, they're not just sort of a casual, at, you know, play sports sometimes or bang out a little tune with your friends. But actually someone wants to achieve excellence. Someone wants to really um, achieve an advanced spiritual state and uh, really get back to God. So, in spiritual life, or religious life, as in sports, as in music, as in academia, as in everything, uh, it's a minority of people, sometimes a small minority, who really are serious about what they're doing, rather than just getting by, getting along. And so that's why this is very important. Because in initiation, uh, of course, uh, the word devotee, or if you're more sophisticated, you may say devotee. <laughs> what do they say in England? Devotee. I know. <laughs> the movement started in America, which has caused inestimable harm, <laughs> at least in the language of ISKCON in many ways. But so the word devotee comes from the Latin de voto. Voto means a vow. The word voto in Latin, of course, comes just Sanskrit vrata. Just take out the R and it's Latin. And if we study historical linguistics, we see that people tend to uh, simplify pronunciation by eliminating consonant clusters, as you all well know. 
So rather than having the VR, they'll just take the R out. It's just easier. So Vrata becomes Vota. You see that actually even in Bengali, for example, uh, sometimes you get a Sanskrit, sorry for this little linguistic attack, but it's a curiosity. For example, if you get three consonants together like KSH, as in Kshetra or Kuru Kshetra, then Bengalis, I guess over time that was a little too complicated. So what they did is um, they eliminated the S. So it becomes Kuru Ketra or Parikit Maharaj. It's just a, a, it's a very common example of simplifying consonant clusters. Sometimes, rather than uh, eliminate something, where you can, when there's only two consonants and you can't eliminate it, sometimes in Bengali they insert an extra vowel. Like, for example, K and T, which are both hard consonants. So instead of saying Bhakta, to avoid that KT, they just say Bhakata. But it's all the same thing, anyway. So, along the lines, those same lines, linguistic lines, um, Vrata becomes Voto. And you get the word Voto, which means a vow, like to vote for someone, to vow to someone. So the word De Voto literally means uh, by a vow, or with a vow. So one, by making a vow, by pledging yourself to Krishna with a vow, you literally become a devotee in the linguistic sense. <laughs> I'm not saying that you're not a devotee until you're initiated. Uh, I won't enter that. One of the innumerable silly controversies which uh, habitually arise in religious institutions. But anyway, so it's... Um, but formally, in, in, the, uh, in the linguistic sense, it's, um, you become a devotee by, by making that vow. And people used to take their word very seriously. It's interesting because uh, at a Brahminical level, let's say among people who are trying to live a holy life or a spiritual life, uh, it's very important that you speak the truth and you keep your word, otherwise who will take you seriously? And so, in Vedic culture, in which the cultural standard was set by the Brahmins, this became a big thing. And there's so many examples, like in Mahabharata, when the Pandavas came back from the Swayamvara of Draupadi, and they said basically, hey, the you know, collection was pretty good today. Because they were going out every day, and they were begging. They were, they were dressed kind of in these uh, Jedi knight robes, if you read the Sanskrit, and, uh, and of course the reason they had to dress in those robes is because they were like really big and really muscular, and they're supposed to be Brahmin guys, like young Brahmins, so they had to cover themselves, and um, so they were going to, that's how they lived, because they you know, couldn't get a job, because in those days you didn't just like look in the classified ads or you know, Craigslist or something for a job. Uh, even if you look at medieval Europe, it was the same thing. Everyone had to belong to someone. Everyone had to belong to a guild or a varna. For example, in Sanskrit, um, the typical greeting when two people meet, uh, or let's say if a man meets a woman, he'll say typically kasi, which means who are you, and kasyasi, whose are you? In other words, under whose protection are you? And so, even in medieval Europe, if you are Renaissance Europe, you walked into a town, you couldn't just like apply for a job. Like, who are you? Who's your family? Where do you come from? What guild do you belong to? And so, uh, the Pandavas, uh, they could disguise themselves as Brahmins for the simple reason that they grew up there. That was actually their native cultural language. It's like if you grow up in Lithuania, until you're maybe 13 or 14 years old and then move to England. I mean, you can still obviously speak fluent Lithuanian. And so the, Bra the Pandavas actually grew up as Brahmins, not as Kshatriyas, because their father was up at uh, Shatasringa, which means Hundred Peaks. Uh, they were, their father was up there and they grew up as yogis. In fact, when uh, Pandu and then Madri passed away and they had this dramatic funeral procession that came down from the you know, way up in the mountains, all the way down into the Ganges Valley, into Hastinapur. 
And when they first entered the area, people doubted that they were Pandu's sons because they were just these yogi boys. But anyway, so... Um, kind of go off into the pond of us a little bit there. So, therefore, as, you know, living or presenting themselves to the world as Brahmin boys, <clears throat> they had to live. So every day they'd go out and they'd beg food. And so they came back one day and they said, hey, it was, you know, the collection was pretty good today. They were joking. They, they meant dropity. And then Kunti said, well, just share it with all the boys. And th anyway, you know that story. So, um, Spiritual life, it's, maybe I'll make one more point, and that is unfortunately today, uh, people don't understand what spiritual life is for a simple historical reason. Let's say if you look at the history of Europe or England, you have a period of uh, extremely violent, brutal religious fanaticism. Everyone knows the history, and it's... Um, Hmm? Torquemada. Oh, there's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are lots. I mean, right here in merry old England. Bloody Mary. And, of course, Cromwell. And so, uh, we have a general impression that the religious history is pretty bad. But when you, but when you study it, you find it was actually much worse. <laughs> <laughs> so... As a result of that, for example, in England, they had, after they had these bloody conflicts between Protestants and Catholics for so long, they declared this uh, sort of a, a settlement where no one preached anyone else, but everyone just practiced your own religion. And so you find Western religious history going between these two extremes, an extreme of brutal fanaticism, and then the, uh, the equal and opposite reaction where it's not polite to say that your religion is better than anyone else's religion. Also, so, um, another problem there is that um, that because the religious history of the Western world is a history of, of um, of fanaticism. In other words, something is true not because it makes sense, not because it's reasonable, but because some book said so. And so you have this extremely dangerous separation of what Prabhupada called religion and philosophy. Now, our position is that um, you cannot reason your way to the highest truth. You can't just sit down under an apple tree, or for that matter, a lemon tree, or any fruit tree of your choice. You, know, you can't just sit down and start thinking about things and then figure out that Krishna is God. However, however, once a revelation comes, or if you claim you have a revelation, it must be reasonable. So if you look at the role of religion and philosophy, it's not that you can philosophize yourself to all the truths of the Vedas, but if someone claims they have a revelation, it has to be reasonable. For example, if someone claims that God is all-merciful and God uh, tortures his own children forever for even somewhat subtle doctrinal mistakes, uh, that's a gross contradiction. It's just not, those two things are not compatible. It's like a square circle. As I said, so, I mean, it, logically it can't exist. So, a revelation or someone, a, a claim to a revelation must be reasonable. It has to make sense. It has to be internally consistent. In other words, it can't contradict itself. You can't say on the one hand God's merciful, then God acts practically as the most evil creature ever conceived of by humankind. So it, it must be reasonable. Unfortunately, um, the religions of, of, of the West and the Middle East actually come from the Middle East, which sociologically tended to be a very violent tribal part of the world. And, and uh, the Romans saw this coming a mile away. If you look at the, uh, the annals, the journals, the, the history written by Tacitus, 
the great Roman historian Tacitus, who was a Roman senator, actually just right after, I mean, around the same time as Jesus, maybe just a few years later, but basically around that time. He writes this very sophisticated history, explains everything, but then at the end, the last chapter of his work, he gets really kind of uh, excited, almost angry, because he's warning the Roman people that if these fanatical Middle Eastern religions take hold in Rome, it's going to ruin our civilization. And something like that happened. In the sense that if you look at if you look at uh, Greco-Roman religion, uh, there was what you could call religious syncretism. In other words, take Alexander. Alexander the Great had what he called his one world project, which meant that um, to unite the people of the world, he had this dream of uniting the people of the world, and he knew that people have different religions that they feel strongly about. So the idea was, okay, we worship Zeus, and you maybe you worship Yahweh or, or, or in Egypt with some other name or in Persia, some other name, but we're all worshiping the same God, which was, I think, quite forward thinking. So that was a Greek view. At least that was Alexander's view. Of course, he was much more interested in unity and unifying peoples than the little Greek city-states. But then the Romans very much bought into this. The Romans completely believed in this and because they, they were the great team builders, they were the great organizers, sort of social engineers and bridge engineers and building engineers. And so they very much had this idea of religious syncretism. And so when they saw these religions from the Middle East, which were just terribly fanatical, like we worship the living God, you worship a dead God, we have a true religion, you have a false religion. Basically, it sounded to the Romans the way it would sound to you if you saw someone shouting this on a street corner. You know, if you see some fanatic shouting on a street corner this stuff, I mean, how does it sound to you? How does it sound to just modern educated people? That's how it sounded to the Romans. But because of that, there's a notion of religion, it's just people claiming something that's true just by faith and just because it's in, it written in some book, rather than having to show that your so-called revela revelation is reasonable. It's actually reasonable, and it actually logically explains the human condition. So, what's really needed now, I, I some, and, and of course, pe uh, this devotee has been initiated, and in Prabhupada's mission, initiation especially to encourage someone to go out and help save this poor benighted planet. So, you know the historical synthesis, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. By the way, the S-Y-N, sin, that's Sanskrit sung, like sung kirtan, together kirtan, Greek S-Y-N, shun, which they pronounce like that. So, so the... Uh, Synthesis. Synthesis. So, we have this fanatical, cruel, violent form of religion, which went on for some time. And then you get the natural reaction. People say, like, religious institutions are way too dangerous, and therefore, you know, just do your own thing. And no one has the highest truth, because as soon as someone says they have the highest truth, literally all hell will break loose. So you have modern people very sort of allergic to ultimate truth claims. And even to some extent allergic to religious institutions. So, you know, fortunately we have an anti-allergen. You know, we have a, in our little Vedic pharmacy. So our, our message to people is that uh, we've got to go, we've got to move forward to the next step of the historical dialectic. We can't stay in this. Obviously, we can't go back to cruel, violent, religious fanaticism. I mean, that could ruin your whole day. And simply saying that, okay, no one should ever say they have a highest truth or no one should, you know, people shouldn't join things. That also doesn't really... Uh, doesn't fulfill the purpose of our life. It's like if you go to the market and you just see bad food, unhealthy food, the solution is not starvation. And so in a sense, what modern society has chosen as an antidote 
to bad religion is religious starvation or materialism. So this, the actual solution is uh, good religion. Like if you don't want to eat bad food, I understand, but you better eat good food. And so what, what is good religion? Good religion, as Prabhupada said, would be some kind of process or tradition which actually makes people better. It makes them nicer people, not nastier people. And I have to mention this, I, I can't resist. Actually, not resisting, of course, always seems to get me into interesting situations, but I've observed myself, I have observed that in every religion I've ever seen, frankly, including ours, there are certain people who are like super strict and sort of want to beat other people over the head with rules. I'm not saying that we shouldn't follow rules, I'm not an anarchist, but there are certain people who, they're like really good devotees, they're just not nice people. And so you have to not only be a good devotee, you have to be a good person, and they're not always the same thing, frankly. And I mean, of course, I'm using the word good devotee somewhat facetiously. For example, I was in Israel, and you find some Orthodox people who are just, you know, they're just, some of them, some of them are nice people, but some of them really aren't. You know, they're so strict, they're just, they're, there's something toxic in it. Same thing, I mean, the Muslim, obviously, you see Christian fanatics who want to save the child in the womb and kill everything else. <laughs> Including, you know, all the creatures that crawl on the earth and... Uh, swim in the sea, and fly in the air. And even some uncooperative humans. So, even in Buddhism now, they, they have a trouble in, in, in Myanmar, the former Burma, where it's a Buddhist majority and they're, they're just persecuting, really, this, this little Muslim minority. And so, there's a type of you can get, I mean, if I could use this term, you can get like too serious sometimes about certain aspects of religion. And what Prabhupada always taught, what Prabhupada always taught is that the more spiritual you are, the nicer you are, the more merciful you are, the kinder you are. That's the symptom of advancement. So when we see people in every religion, including ours, some people, I'm not talking about everyone who's strict. I'm not saying everyone who's strict is not nice. I'm just saying there is a class of people who uh, are, you know, pride themselves on being so strict and, and they're not nice people and they harass other people, they offend other people in the name of, you know, being a strict Vaishnava. And there's just something really wrong with that picture. So true spiritual advancement is that you actually become more and more Merciful, and generous, and kind, and understanding. That's, you know, what is it? Vancha kalpa terubhyas cha. That the Vaishnavas are desire trees. I mean, some people say, no, we should go out and like, it's sort of like throwing, you know, just throw crumbs to the fruit of workers in the sense that they don't like the way we present ourselves. It's, you know, their tough luck. Take it or leave it. Real desire tree style. Vancha kalpa terubhyas cha. Kripa sindhu cha. Oceans of mercy. Some people, they're, they're hardly puddles of mercy. Kripa sindhu cha. Patita nam pavane. So, some people think that the more advanced you are, the more you separate yourself from the material world. In other words, uh, by dress, by food, by, by everything humanly possible, separate yourself, be different. Reinforce the idea that we're separate and, of course, superior. Well, what does our philosophy really say? Take the Paramahamsa, which means the most advanced devotee, completely Krishna conscious. Interestingly, if you study the progression from the Kanishta Adhikar, the word Kanishta in Sanskrit means lowest. That's what the word means. And so if you look at the word, at the consciousness, as described in Shastra, the lowest devotee up to the middle position, Madhyamadhikari, 
to the Uttam Adhikari or the Paramahangs, what we find is that one more and more is able to be part of the world. For example, the, the description of what the Bhagavatam calls a Prakrita Bhakta, a materialistic devotee or devotee on the material platform, is Archayami Vaharaye, Pujang Jaksadhaye Hate, that a person who faithfully undertakes to worship the Lord, but Archayameva only in the deity. In other words, Krishna consciousness means go to a nice opulent temple, do a lot of puja, and go home and, I don't know, you know, and do something else. So, and what the Bhagavatam specifically says is, Natad bhakteshu chanyeshu. That person does not see the deity, does not worship the deity in all other people. And it's specifically mentioned Tad Bhaktesha, the Lord's, the deity's devotees, and also uh, Anyeshu, other people, everybody else. And so if someone's like that, they're, you know, they're really into puja, but that person doesn't really care doesn't care that much about other people. That's the material platform, according to the Bhagavatam. Now, if you look at the Madhya Madhikari, as we know, the Madhya Madhikari forms four relationships to worship Krishna. So, at the next stage, you don't stop worshiping Krishna. You worship Krishna, but then you make friendship with the devotees, real friendship. Not just like your bowling partner, Prabhu. But you make, you make friendship for the purpose of serving. And uh, you preach. You go out and try to spread this movement. And that's what your friendship is. And then if someone's really offensive, then you avoid them. But consider the description of the lowest devotee on the material platform and then the Madhya Madhikari. The Madhya Madhikari engages the world. The Madhya Madhikari has re- friendship with devotees and goes out and kindly tries to help everybody else. So the Madhya Madhikari is much more in the world as a devotee. So a, a, a third class devotee can be in the world, but you know, maybe working or doing this or doing something for himself or herself. But the second class devotee is out there in the world relating to people for their benefit. So that means the contact between the Madhyam Adhikar, the devotional contact between the Madhyam and the world is much greater. A third class devotee, because a third class devotee specifically does not see Krishna in everyone, therefore, how will I relate to these people? If you see that they're part of Krishna, even people that you know, really perform sinful activities like wearing t-shirts and pants, thus willfully degrading themselves. So, but it's precisely because the second class devotee knows that these people are ultimately also part of Krishna. Now what about the Paramahansa? The Paramahansa actually sees everyone as a devotee. That means at the, at the highest level, one is, in a sense, completely in the world because materially you're not in the world or, or in terms of consciousness. So it's like the more your consciousness is in the material world, the more your consciousness is mundane, the less you associate with the world because everything will degrade you. Whereas when you come to the second class platform, you can go out into the world to preach. Why? Because you see people in relation to Krishna. And at the Paramahansa stage, you only see Krishna. And you only see devotees. And even if someone is degraded or someone's you know, not a devotee, even in their material activities, they're actually engaged in Krishna's program. Because it's Krishna who created this world in a way that if you don't see him or don't see yourself as a soul, 
then you got to sort of go through the you got to go through this, uh, uh, all these material things and, and experience this and experience that, this body, that body. So even in their material troubles or the material life, a Paramahansa sees they are fully engaged in Krishna's program. Krishna created this whole system. And even, for example, if you're walking down the street, you just see a mother uh, loving her child. You see Krishna. You see Krishna because... It's Krishna in the heart of that mother that tells her to love her child and not eat it. I mean, as disgusting as that may sound, in certain species of life, mothers and fathers recycle their kids. It happens. So mothers don't automatically love children. It's because Krishna's in the heart and because Krishna loves that child that the mother loves the child. And so when you see a mother loving a child, when you see just like people laugh, laughing, I mean, any, so many different activities. When you see beautiful architecture, you know that even though that is not pure consciousness, still, whatever value there is, it came from Krishna. And that's exactly what Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita. Jajad vibhuti matsatvam. Whatever you see in this world, even if it's not wearing a dhoti. You know, whatever you see in this world, jad jad vibhuti mat satang, srimat, vibhuti mat, vibhuti mat, whatever you see in this world that's, that's like glorious or powerful, srimat, beautiful, urjitam, like strong, evacha, tatareva, tatareva in Sanskrit means something like uh, in each and every case. In each and every case, Avagachatvam, you sh understand. Even the word understand is interesting. I mean, Sanskrit's interesting. Ava in Sanskrit means downward, like an avatar, the down crosser. In other words, the one who crosses down from the spiritual to the material realm to help us. Tara means crossing. Like same root as the word tirtha, which literally means a tirtha is a crossing where you cross from the material world to the spiritual world. So avatara, the down crosser, Literally is what it means. And uh, so ava, then gacha, gacha means go, ga, go. It's the same words in English. So ava gacha means go down. What does that mean? It means go deeply into it. So we translate it understand. Actually, the word understand is kind of getting at the sense because think of understand, to stand beneath something. In other words, go beneath the surface. Don't be superficial. Even the English word understand means to go beneath the surface. And that's actually what avagacha means. It means go deeply into it. That's what Krishna is saying. So Krishna says, whatever you see in this world that's impressive, beautiful, powerful, you know, or to use a more explicit word, far out. Whatever you see in this world, you should go deeply into it and see tattareva. Avagachatang mama tenjo angsa. It is just, as we translate, a spark of my splendor. Angsha means a part. Angsha is the same word Krishna uses in 15.5 in the Gita to describe us. That, uh, what is that? Um, Jiva Bhuta Sanat, Mamai Vangsha. Where the living being is part of me alone. Krishna doesn't just say the living being is part of me, of me alone, because we think. I'm part of my country, I'm part of my family, I'm part of this, I'm part of that. But Krishna says, actually, you're part of me alone. And by extension, you're part of other things. So, mamai vangsa jiva, so it's that same word, angsha, is the word Krishna used. Tejo angsha. Tejo means splendor, power. And so Krishna says, it is, a, it is an angsha. It's an integral part of my splendor. So an advanced devotee sees this. It's not just that you, you know, have a nice Gita class and talk about it and then walk out the door and just, you know, the world's ugly and filthy and horrible and, and sure, do you tell everybody how ugly, filthy and horrible the world is and how ugly, filthy and terrible they are? I mean, the material world is, you know, it's a nasty place, we know that. But, a great devotee of Lord Chaitanya, Prabodhananda Saraswati, said, Bishampurna Sukhayate, that when one is advanced, uh, the whole world brings happiness. 
So what do you mean by that? Vishwam Purna. Purna means full. Like Purnima, Purnim, and this gone. Purnima means the full moon. Purni, like Purnamasa, the full moon, literally full moon. So, so the whole world, Vishwam Purna, the whole universe, Sukhayate, transforms into happiness for a Krishna conscious person. That's also our preaching. So if one is advanced, one can see this. And it gives you freedom. It gives you flexibility. It gives you agility to do what you have to do to make non-devotees comfortable so that they can come to Krishna. Because it's the first law of social psychology that people want to be with other people who are like them. That's why if you look at London, for example, why do you find, you know, the, I don't know, African neighborhoods, Latino neighborhoods, this neighborhood, that neighborhood, Arab neighborhoods, same thing in America. You go to Los Angeles, New York. Why? Because people want to be with people who are like them. And so the more we present ourselves as the total other, the longer we will go through this you might have to call it a drought. Prabhupada built up a powerful, relevant movement. And he said, when I'm gone, if you can't increase it, at least maintain it. Unfortunately, all over the Western world, that did not happen. And so, so now what? Some people say we shouldn't use the mundane word, actually the horribly mundane word West, in conjunction with Krishna. It's like don't bring the totally profane in juxtaposition with the totally holy. What about Prabhupada's Pranam Mantra? Paschatya Desha I mean, he started it. That's how Prabhupada described himself. Namaste Saraswati Devi. If you look at Prabhupada's Pranam Mantra, which is, of course, like a typical sloka divided into four parts, the first part, Prabhupada says who he is. He introduces himself. I am a servant of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. Saraswati Devi. And then he says, Godavani Prachayani. I am preaching the message of Lord Chaitanya. And Nirvishesha Shunyavari Pasyati Deshtani. The whole second half of his Pranam Mantra, which he wrote. There was no one else to do it. In other words, half of his Pranam Mantra is simply explaining that he came to this world to save the Western countries. That's half of his Pranam Mantra. So, if we're not saving the Western countries, uh, there's something wrong. And it doesn't mean we should all panic or, you know, become, like, just kill yourself by eating an incredibly large amount of goranga potatoes or something, but <laughs> we have to... So if I, if I went to Prabhupada, having been trained by Prabhupada, if I went to Prabhupada and explained this is a situation, I'm not blaming anyone. It's like, I'm not saying it's this person's fault or that person's fault. It simply is a situation. So if I went to Prabhupada and explained the situation, I know exactly what he would say. He would say, fix it. He would say, fix it. So, in a sense, um, those of us who are alive today in the Hare Krishna movement, uh, we're all very fortunate. One can think that devotees who were with Swamiji in New York were very fortunate, and they were. But I think in a sense we're even, if anything, more fortunate. All of you, why? Because Prabhupada needs us more than ever. If you think about it, history repeats itself, or equally fortunate, there was a time when Prabhupada came to New York, he was all alone, he, was, he really needed help to get his movement going. And then Krishna sent help. So those people... Those devotees who met and joined Prabhupada were very fortunate because they met Prabhupada at a time when he really needed them and so they could become very dear to Prabhupada. And those times have come again. And obviously the movement's established, it's all over the world. 
I'm not saying nothing good is going on. But it's not exactly what Prabhupada had in mind. In my Vyas Puja uh, offering this year, I, I gave many, many quotes from Prabhupada where he strongly emphasizes that in the Western countries, you have to attract Western people. This is a big deal for Prabhupada. It wasn't just, it's nice if you can do it. It was actually the essence of his mission in the West. That's why he got on the boat. So that's our mission. Those who really care about Prabhupada, that's our mission. And then I, I've written papers uh, trying to give a clear picture of what Prabhupada's parameters are. Sometimes we hear that Prabhupada liked this and didn't like that. He wanted this, he didn't want that. And occasionally those statements are accurate. Uh, but a lot of times they're not. A lot of times they're not. Everything from, anyway, I could go on and on about this. But So what I've tried to do is um, quote Prabhupada. I've given, and, and, and I've shown people, this is what Prabhupada actually said. So if you've heard a different version of Prabhupada, you need to read this. And in my own attempt at service, um, I think I can say that I'm strictly following Prabhupada's instructions. There are many people in this movement that may not know I'm doing that, but then again, they may not read that much. So, uh, so initiation, I haven't forgotten you. <laughs> That's really what it's about. Prabhupada came to America. It's funny, I'm always in America. I've almost said Prabhupada came to this country. Well, he did come to this country. He certainly came many times. That he thought England was a very important country. The UK, or the former UK, or whatever it is. <laughs> so, so this is a very important historical time. I mean, his, historians in the future will look back on this time, and they will see who responded and who didn't, who really understood what was going on, who really understood the urgency, the historical danger. After Lord Chaitanya uh, disappeared, the movement, of course, it, was, it became very powerful, but after a relatively short time, 100, 150 years, uh, the movement kind of collapsed. And if you look at ISKCON's Western movement, uh, unfortunately, it, you could make a very strong case that history is repeating itself. So if we think, no, it'll automatically go on, you know, the prophecies will kick in. Um, you need to read history. You need to read history and to see the real dangers involved here. And so um, we need to turn this around. We need to actually, and, and Prabhupada, someone could say, well, what does it mean to spread the movement? Well, how about common sense. For example, when I said I was GBC in Latin America, Prabhupada really loved that it was growing. When I, I remember going into Prabhupada's room and he would really say, he would say to me, how many devotees are you making? How many centers are opening? He wanted numbers. I don't mean to say that we're just going to get into the whole number thing. We don't care about people. People are just numbers like Sika points, book points, you know, Loxby points. You know, I don't want to get into that old consciousness because it's, you know, there's obvious problems with that, but we care about people. We're trying to help people, but initiation, it's, it, it means someone enlisted. We're trying to fix this for Prabhupada. And if someone says there's nothing to fix, uh, at least they could sort of kindly step aside so the people who, who, can, who open their eyes and see what's going on can get to work. So, before I give the initiation, any questions on these points? Yes? Thank you. Going back to Prabhupada's pranam what I find interesting is that because it's focusing on the West, but in a sense we say he saves the whole world, should there be, is it like, he just specifically concentrated on the West? Or okay, yeah, let's talk about the West. Have, would, would someone have a pranam mantra for? Delivering China, say for example. Yes. On the point of pranamantras, who who made who created your pranamantras? 
Okay. Uh, okay, for your first question, um, Prabhupada emphasized over and over and over again he depended on his Western mission. Some people say things, well, why not Krishna north or south? And I say, maybe, because there's no such thing as northern culture. There's no such thing as southern culture. Is that a good reason? So, um, it's like you get the West, you get the world. Clearly, Prabhupada cared about everyone. Clearly, Prabhupada wanted to save every country. But you have to have a strategy. And that was Prabhupada's strategy, and he made it very clear, he was very explicit about it. Especially the need to preach in those countries where we do the worst. Namely, first world Western countries. Western Europe, America, Australia, Canada, and so on. Not to forget New Zealand. <laughs> sort of like the, uh, the hidden, hidden power there. <laughs> so, it's a great country. So, um, so, the West is of extraordinary, and we could say unique, strategic importance. That's how Prabhupada saw it, and, that's how, and he constantly said that. Now, I don't know if in all this enthusiasm to keep Prabhupada in the center, if that important part of Prabhupada is being kept in the center. I've heard some leading figures in this movement say that maybe we, you know, the time is over when we preach in the West. Maybe we should be like the Amish in America who have an official policy of not preaching. And we have some of our biggest leaders saying we should be like them. In other words, it's better to maintain exotic... South Asian styles and let the world go to hell. So, um, yeah, the West is of unique and, and overwhelming strategic importance. And therefore, if we do everything else and don't advance this mission in the West, we have not actually fulfilled Prabhupada's self-description, Paschatya Deshatarni. It's like they say the operation was a success, but the patient died. So, um, second thing, my Pranam Mantra? Yes. It was actually written for me by a god brother, who I think is no longer an Iskon, named Hiranya Garba, who used to be in England. Originally Canadian, I think. Kindly wrote it. So, any other question? Yes. Um, Maharaj, regarding that, the Krishna West, beyond um, beyond giving up the uh, let's say the external thing like the clothes and what have you, the Indian style of dress, what is the strategy beyond just let's say, giving up those things? Uh, I have, I think, I have a lot of faith in the, the Maha Mantra and uh, the Bhagavad Gita as the basic presentation for the public, and prasadam. So, I think that within ISKCON there's this very deep-rooted, and I believe false, assumption that somehow, let's say, Indian clothes, food, architecture, everything, are somehow symptomatic of, and almost you could say the cause of, serious spirituality. And that if one uh, wears Western, it's not even Western anymore, I mean, let's get real, it's, it's global. I mean, you can go to Mongolia or, you know, Argentina, you can go anywhere in the world and people basically, you know, it's just a, it's more and more just a global culture. Uh, that if you sort of fit in with the world, that somehow that is a symptom of uh, slackening in your spiritual practice. And that's a very deep-rooted stereotype in the Hare Krishna movement. And of course, I think, it's, I think it's false. I think it's false. 
it, it doesn't mean that every devotee that wears pants is, is an advanced devotee. I just mean, though, that you can't judge someone's advancement by looking at how they dress. I mean, what, isn't it kind of silly if we tell the world, you're not your body, but you are your clothes? Mm -hmm. And so because of that, that deep-rooted assumption, people ask what you, I mean, what you just asked me is, is a question I get all the time. And my simple answer is, we don't have a different spiritual program. It's Prabhupada's program. It's, it's Prabhupada's system of sadhana bhakti. Chants, you, know, you chant your rounds, you follow the principles, you do kirtan, study books, and so on. It's just, it's the same program. So I think, I mean, just being objective from a socio-psychological perspective, um, a certain style of dress or music, I think, has been become such a fundamental part of the devotee's self-understanding. It's become so fundamental that they... I mean, some devotees can hardly imagine spiritual life. It's not spiritual life at all. So it's almost like the goal... It, it's, and, and for we're probably the movement, of all the movements in the world, probably the one that most preaches, you're not your body. So, this doesn't mean cultural chaos. doesn't mean, like, like, I always get these questions endlessly that, does that mean, you know, I can just wear cut-off jeans into the temple or women wear God knows what? Or... Krishna actually gives a, a cultural criteria in the Gita. It's, you can't just dress any way you like. You can't just eat whatever you like. Krishna actually gives a standard. But the standard is sattva guna. So, for example, let's say you dress in a way which is decent, clean, appropriate, and all that. That's the standard. Otherwise, if you... There's a confusion. People, there are people among us who confuse two very different things. One is a cultural principle. The other is an ethnic detail. So, for example, when you go to a house of God, to use a term found actually in the Vedas, a house of God, Deva Griha. When you go to a house of God, you show respect. You don't, you don't, you, in the way you dress, you show respect that you're in the house of God. I didn't learn that from this movement. I learned it from my mother. You know, as a kid, when we went to a place of worship, we wore very nice clothes, we dressed up, we were clean, because you have to respect a sacred place. If instead of using Krishna's standard, which is sattva guna, and by the way, when you offer sattva to Krishna, it becomes vishuddha sattva, and that's the standard term for spiritual platform. You know, that's the spiritual science. If you want to present an ethnic tradition, good luck. But if you want to present a spiritual science, that's the spiritual science that Krishna teaches. Krishna never says... First of all, he never says, always think of me, dress like me. I mean, should we wear peacock feathers? We, should all of us, you know, you and maybe we'll go out, you know, put some mascara on our eyes. Or maybe I should come in here bare-chested and, you know, cause another scandal. You know, Krishna went bare-chested. Not to mention the fact that the word dhoti is not even in the scriptures because it's not a Sanskrit word. So... So, mode of goodness, you're going to a house of God, show respect. Your man or woman, show respect, decency, be clean, be appropriate. Saying you should wear a particular style of dress, Indian or whatever, that's not the standard, because as we know, a sari and that great, you know, the, the choli, it, it, it really convinces, you know, when a woman bears half her torso, it, it definitely convinces everyone that, you know, in the West that it's very chaste. So, as we know, it's possible to wear a sari in a way that's, um, frankly, erotic. Whereas, it's not possible to be erotic and in the mode of goodness. That's impossible. 
So if I look at the way someone's dressed and I say, that is not sattva guna, that is not decent, it's not appropriate, there's no argument. But if I say, say Indian clothes, oh my God, you can, you know, you can expose a, a very large percentage of your anatomy in Indian clothes. And, and, and so what I want to teach is a spiritual science based on objective principles, not based on ethnic chauvinism. Because the world doesn't want it. The, the world, outside of India, or the Indian community, really doesn't want it. And it's really not our philosophy. For example, the Choli, just one little detail and we'll go on. Uh, the, in, there was an ancient dynasty, royal dynasty in southeast India, roughly what is today Tamil Nadu, that was called the Chola dynasty. And they had a certain style of blouse which became called Cholis from the Chola dynasty. That's all it is. <laughs> yes? Well, you often um, say that there is a, a space even in the Western world for a holy man to wear holy clothes. Sure. Um, I'm a big fan of yours. I'm one of your big internet fans. I listen to a lot of what you say. Um, but, for example, I came to your program in Reading the other day, and I spoke to somebody yesterday, and the first question they asked was, why is your And I said, yeah, he was but that's not really relevant, but my point is, don't you think you bring so much less heat on you and what you're trying to preach that normal people like me and most of us here, if you just, you know, went Dalai Lama style, water, water, <laughs> the all the time, so I ask with respect. No, it's a good question. It's, 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 a, it's, it's a good question. It's a question I've asked myself. <laughs> and I, I always respect myself. Um... It's a, it's a very good question, and it's, uh, it bears consideration. I think ultimately, you know, praying and trying to understand Krishna's will and just trying to use my God-given intelligence, because ultimately it's just about what's best for the movement, what's best for power, what's best for the world. It's not, I mean, I would be a hypocrite and a fool if I sacrificed the good of the world or the good of ISKCON just to indulge my own preferences. So I understand my own responsibility to do what's best, not just to do what, because, you know, not do what I like. So, one point is that um, if you do something which is hardly ever done among us, and that is, study objectively what's going on in the world. For example, I saw an article that uh, they did a study very recently, just very, very recently, which they studied uh, Protestant churches in the UK to see which ones are growing and which ones are not growing or even diminishing. And what they found is that, very interesting, that the churches are not making it do two things. And the churches that are growing do two other things. And I think that article confirmed that we got it right. The churches that are growing adjust the, the externals. In other words, like the architecture, the dress, it's not medieval. It's sort of 21st century. You know, decent. Whereas in the preaching, and this is very interesting, the churches that are growing preach strongly. People are really suffering in this world. I mean, everyone knows the world's gone mad, especially in America. So everyone knows the world's gone mad, and, uh, and they, want, they want strength. You know, if you go to a boxing match, and one boxer, they're, they're both kind of these you know, effeminate guys, and you know, one goes like that. And, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to bruise you there. And you know, the, people want to see strength. Like if you go to a some kind of, you know, if you want to watch a movie about mutants, you know, you're, you you want to get your money's worth. And so, people like strength. <laughs> Everyone in this room that's a is is a mutant. Please raise your hand. <laughs> Has some special power. Anyway, so people are actually attracted to strong, reasonable preaching. 
They don't want, for example, what you find in the Protestant churches, let's say starting about over 100 years ago, maybe 120 years ago, and I don't know the exact dates, but the, um, the, the Protestant uh, seminary students and general Protestant ministers, uh, some of the best seminaries, for example, in America and New England, we have you know, Harvard and Princeton and Yale and all these schools, very intellectual places. And so in this atmosphere of, of really serious, heavy scholarship, they began adopting certain kinds of compromises. In other words, uh, miracles. Like, okay, we know that in this world, everything really goes on according to the laws of nature. And so if someone claimed there was a miracle, like a burning bush, maybe it was just this, some you know, chemical, or it was that. And so you find ministers, but sort of intellectual ministers were also professors at some of the top schools. They, they want to be intellectually respectable at their universities. So if you're at the Harvard Seminary, or what, the Divinity School, or Yale or Princeton, I mean, you're in, you're in a top university, and so you don't want to be a fool at the, on campus. And so you start to get this preaching which sort of softens the, the strong parts of religious history or religious philosophy. And what's happened, interestingly, is the, the sort of educated, uh, respectable, socially very respectable Protestant churches are going down. And they've been going down for some time. And when you get the really strong preaching, like no nonsense, like, you know, you need to serve God, you need to do this, you need to change your life, those churches are actually growing. Because people want something with substance. And so, ironically, I would say in many ISKCON projects, not all of them, of course, we do the opposite. The churches that are shrinking retain all kinds of archaic external things and the preaching sometimes is indirect. So you have, you have this interesting phenomenon in ISKCON and eventually I'll get to your question but I'm, I'm, this is kind of was my thinking. And so um, because our, you could say, orthodox presentation is, and we can just you know, not be completely in la-la land here, uh, strikes most people as very exotic to say the least. Therefore, you have this attempt to compensate for that in mainstream ISKCON so that the very same devotees who really promote this very orthodox, strange presentation, strange in the West, when they do go out to Western preaching, kind of say it's something else. In other words, it's yoga, or it's self-help, or it's the other thing, or it's that other thing. And so you have these two extremes of a, like this very, I would say, how should I put it, somewhat archaic, this very orthodox presentation. And then because the public has a certain image of us, you have to go to the other extreme to try to pull them in and tell them it's something else. And so in Krishna West, um, what I'm trying to do is just get back to the middle. Because if you present yourself in a way which doesn't strike anyone as strange, or any normal person, so that people are comfortable with me, they immediately think, oh, you're a normal, respectable person. Then I don't need to camouflage what I'm doing. I can say very openly that I'm, I'm a, I, I practice and teach bhakti yoga. That's what I do. It comes from the Bhagavad Gita and so on and so forth. So the more on, on, on the surface you're normal, the more, so to speak, social capital you have to then be direct in your preaching. And that's exactly what's working. That's actually what's working. So, I could, let's say, just to keep peace in ISKCON, I could always wear a dhoti, and I have a, a fine dhoti. <laughs> and, uh, however, one thought in my mind is, that I, I want to show support for all the devotees around the world that are helping me. And so I don't want to, I, I want to show that I'm sort of in there in the trenches with them. And also I want to make the point, which I think is important, that, um, well, personally, me, 
I, I, I do not feel more Krishna conscious wearing Indian clothes. For example, if I wore traditional Iskand sannyas dress, um, the shirt is a Muslim shirt, the Korta, as we know, and the dhoti comes from the Ram Krishna mission. Prabhupada, one time I was in Vrindavan with Prabhupada, it was for the festival time, and I was leaving to go back to the West, and so I went to say goodbye to Prabhupada. He was in his garden. And he would always just say things to me. He liked to, you know, he'd talk to me about different things. So he said to me, do you know the song of the six Goswamis? Vande Rupa. So I said, yes. He said, the six Goswamis were the ideal Vaishnava sannyasis. And uh, because we know Lord Chaitanya took sannyas from another group. So through the six Goswamis, Lord Chaitanya actually reestablished Vaishnava sannyas. And Gaudiya Vaishnava sannyas. So he said to me, you study that song, you will understand real sannyas. Now, the simple fact is that we do not dress like them. Because their dress is described in that song, Kopina Kantasrito. They wore Kopin and rags. If I came in here in a Kopin and rags, you know, probably the women would run out of the room and there'd be screams and cries and... <laughs> So, and Prabhupada, for example, this thing that we should dress like Krishna. Anyway, if, if you really wanted to dress like Krishna, if someone thinks that's a principle of Bhakti Yoga, the Rupa Goswami never mentioned it, and Prabhupada, you know, it's just, but somehow you think that you should do that. Then isn't it obvious that you should dress like Krishna in this age? I mean, why dress like Krishna in Dwapara Yuga? You're not in Dwapara Yuga. You're going to carry a flute in your belt? Why not dress like Krishna in this age? But Prabhupada didn't. And Bhakti Siddhanta didn't. And Bhakti you No know, Thakur didn't. If you look at the cover of Chaitanya Charitamrita, the various volumes, you can see how Lord Chaitanya dressed. According to the BBT, we don't dress like that. Prabhupada rejected for himself Lord Chaitanya's dress. Now, if you want to dress like Lord Chaitanya, you're probably thrown out of ISKCON. And yet, that's, that's Krishna in this age. Not only that, Prabhupada, one time I was walking with Prabhupada on the roof of his Mayapur building. I think they call it the Lotus Building. And Prabhupada was telling me how, again, some of his god brothers were criticizing him because he was flying around the world on jet planes instead of, you know, Lord Chaitanya walked. And Prabhupada said, should I be a fool and walk instead of taking a plane? I have to preach. So why dress like Krishna? But, I mean, if you really want to be like Krishna, throw away your cell phone, throw away your computer. You should never again use a motorized vehicle. Don't use electric or gas stoves. Don't use refrigerators. You want to live like Krishna? You know, do it. But let's see who's going to do it. So to wear kind of clothes that Lord Chaitanya never wore, and then to use all... So it's... This is supposed to be a spiritual science. I, but getting back to your question now. Getting back to your question, um, it's a cost-benefit analysis. Clearly, if I was more conventional in certain venues, I might get, as you say, less heat. But on the other hand, I believe there would also be a loss. And so I, I guess I analyze, it's pragmatic. Like, what's the loss, what's the gain, and what ultimately is... I personally believe, with all respect to all respectable Vaishnavas, that, um, that this is actually critical. It's actually urgent that ISKCON... Uh, find a way, or some project has gone find a way to... The clock is ticking also. Because right now, as we know, and this is not a criticism uh, of anyone, but as we know, our movement is very rapidly becoming uh, basically an Indian movement. Or a movement comprised of people coming from a Hindu background. I want to just go out of my way to emphasize 
devotees from a Hindu background are not the problem. They are great souls. I always say this, but I, I see that I can say something thousands of times and some people never hear it. They're actually, they're, they're Krishna's devotees. We should be proud of them. We should congratulate them. The fact that a particular community of people is coming to serve Krishna, and that's not a problem. How could it be a problem that a group of people want, you know, wants to serve Krishna? That's not only not a problem, it's, it's, it's wonderful that they're coming to serve Krishna. The problem is, where's everybody else? So, unless we do something, when I look at Prabhupada's life, I see that Prabhupada constantly changed his strategy when one thing didn't work. He was going around, basically he, he wanted to make a lot of money and give it to his guru's mission. That's why he's, you know, he's working so hard, traveling all over, selling his pharmaceutical products, but then it, you know, it didn't work out. Krishna kind of sabotaged the business because he had other plans for Prabhupada. Then Prabhupada eventually went to Jansi, and he saw it's not working. I mean, Prabhupada lost that building in Jansi. He could have tried to get another building. He didn't have to leave there, but he decided this is not really the solution. He went to Delhi, he printed his back to God, the sheets, and he went around. Then he just saw... I mean, obviously, when Prabhupada went around Delhi giving out his back to God at sheets, he met nice people, some people's lives were changed, and it's not that nothing happened. It wasn't zero. And even in Jansi, I'm sure he helped a lot of people. But it wasn't what he was looking for. He was looking for a large-scale, powerful movement. So then someone told him, why don't you go write books? You know, these sheets are nice, but... People won't take them that seriously. So then he went to Vrindavan. And when he first printed his, his, his Bhagavatam, he was going around to important people, like that prime minister who was killed by the Russians, uh, Bahudar Law or something. And, uh, you know, he'd get his picture taken, give books to important people. He's writing letters. It's not that he wasn't preaching before he got on the boat. He was writing letters to important people, but just nothing was happening. Not on the level he knew it had to happen. So then he came to America. And he went to Butler, Pennsylvania. Now, if you read the Lilamrita, it's not obvious that when he got to Butler, he said, like, oh my God, i got to get out of here. This is like that song by Creedence Clearwater. Oh no, stuck in old Lodi. Oh no, stuck in old Butler again. But he... Anyway, it's a song from the 60s. So... <laughs> so he was in Butler for a while, and then when he kind of got his bearings, he realized the revolution is not going to start in Butler. So he went to New York. When he went to New York, he fell in with um, Dr. Mishra. And for a while, that was the program. He'll work with Dr. Mishra. He'll preach to some of the students. But for various reasons, that didn't work out. You know, Dr. Mishra was nice, but didn't want Prabhupada taking his students. And it was just, it just wasn't. Again, something was happening. He was impressing people. He was making friends but it just wasn't really happening. So what did he do? He went to the, down to the Lower East Side and then he started New York. And So, if you look at Prabhupada's... There's one more point I want to make since I... What time is it? Holy cow. Uh, okay, I'll try to wrap this up. Don't worry. <laughs> within, within your lifetime, you will be initiated. So... <laughs> And it's not like a taxi. I mean, the price isn't going up. <laughs> My inspiration is a particular period, what I call, in some ways, for me, was the golden age of ISKCON in the West. And that's what I want to get back to. I'll tell you what it was and why I call it the golden age. It was roughly from 67, you could even say 66, to about 1970. It was a golden age because at that time uh, the relationship between Prabhupada and the devotees was different. The relationship between the devotees and the public was different. The relationship among devotees was different. And so I'll explain all those things. At that time, Prabhupada came to the West to stay. I mean, he even said, of course, in 66 in his New York lectures that my home is in Vrindavan, but I'm visiting your country. But 
at a certain point, in, in fact, when he discovered how good the weather is in LA, it's not Florida. Please don't. Please don't confuse California weather with Florida. I'm from California. It's actually, you know, never really gets that hot, doesn't get that cold. So, and if you look up Los Angeles in Veda Base, you know, it's like hundreds of statements from Prabhupada saying how nice the property in Escon, he wanted to make it his headquarters. And Prabhupada really was America based. And it's not just my national pride that makes me appreciate that. It's the fact that he, he was just really doing everything he could for the Western mission. And if you look at, like, read Mukunda Goswami's book, which is really good, or Guru Das's book, or if you read these biographies from back from that time, um, Prabhupada's relationship with the devotees was that he was delighted to be the spiritual master, not to micromanage everyone's life, and just let the devotees figure out how to spread the movement in their country. So, for example, why did they go to twenty? Why did they go to the Lower East Side? It's not that Prabhupada wanted to go there. The, the devotees told Prabhupada, "That's where it's happening. That's the scene." So Prabhupada went there. Why did he publish the um, that peace formula? little brochure. Because the devotee said right now the big topic is the war in Vietnam, the peace movement. So Prabhupada responded, why did he go to San Francisco? And which was, you know, monumental uh, phase in ISKCON history. Why? Because the devotees told Prabhupada we need to go there. There's something happening out there. And so you look at pictures and you see Prabhupada's western disciples in Western dress, Prabhupada is, you know, some holy man from India, and he's delighted. When my godbrother Balavanta ran for mayor in Atlanta, and Prabhupada saw a picture of him with, with a coat and a tie, Prabhupada said, this is, this is in, you know, one of Satrupa's books. Prabhupada said, this is what I always wanted. This is what I always wanted, that you become known as American Vaishnavas. So I'm trying to put the real Prabhupada, you know, the complete Prabhupada back in the center of ISKCON. Not the ultra-conservative Prabhupada sort of created by some conservatives in their own image. So the relationship between Prabhupada and the devotees was traditional. He was the guru without question. He knows Krishna and we're learning about Krishna from him. But in terms of material details, you know, even things like dressing and where to go and how to present things, he thought, you're Americans, you must know that. It wasn't the mythical Prabhupada who's basically a, sort of a, you know, a plenary portion of Chiro Dakshai Vishnu, another super soul that knows everything, that knows what American history is going to be in 50 years. It was a real Prabhupada who was a pure devotee that Krishna sent to save us and who took the traditional role of a pure devotee. So then, what were the relations between among devotees? It was much more collegial. Prabhupada said, if, if ISKCON becomes too hierarchical, if you have heavy leaders that just tell everyone what to do, Prabhupada said, that will ruin this movement. That's Prabhupada speaking. That will ruin this movement. All these quotes are in a paper I wrote. Obviously, there has to be order. There have to be rules. You know, people, just like in traffic, you can't just drive any side of the road you want. I mean, we're not talking about anarchy here. We're not talking about a some, kind of some, you know, hippie commune or something. There are standards. There are rules. There has to be order. However, the relationship is much more collegial. Prabhupada said the whole purpose of this movement is to train people to be independently thoughtful, not mindlessly submissive. So, that was actually the relationship among devotees. What about the public? We fit in totally, of course, with the young people. I mean, we were young, and the older people we couldn't relate to very much. But And, and so... And the fact that Prabhupada was really there in the front lines with us, he really identified like I have an American movement and I live here in this country. There was something just so wonderful about that, to have Prabhupada really as a resident in the West. And then, of course, 
the, the, the trigger that changed everything, and this is all in the Lilamrita, this is not my you know, imagination, my version of history. If you read the Lilamrita, there were these four sannyasis that sort of betrayed Prabhupada. And Prabhupada was heartbroken. In fact, if you look at pictures, there's there a whole set of black and white pictures of Prabhupada at the time where he becomes very thin because he stopped eating. He, he was so devastated that his own spiritual children could do this. It really affected him. And so there's a very, this is only Lamrita, there's a very famous scene where Prabhupada called, I think it was Rupanuga and Bhagavan that he trusted. They were still loyal. And he said, he said, there's fire in the house. You have to take me out of here. Don't forget that Prabhupada knew that his own guru had survived an assassination attempt. So, <clears throat> Prabhupada said, there's fire in the house, you have to take me out of here. So they said, well, we can go to New York. Prabhupada said, no, the fire is there. Then they said, we'll go to London. No offense. <clears throat> and uh, again, Prabhupada said, the fire is there. So why did Prabhupada go back to India? He wanted the, to be on his own turf. Because in India, Prabhupada could really, at every level, you know, he was the, he could control everything. So that, he went back to India, where he felt secure, and he could really do what he wanted. And when he went back there, there's even that scene, scene where Prabhupada's standing in front of Rukmini Dwarka in New Dwarka, saying goodbye, because Prabhupada declared that my world headquarters is Los Angeles. And they still declared, actually, anyway, I won't make the obvious jokes. So, Prabhupada declared that this is my world headquarters. And so, he thought, I've come all the way across the world. I made my home here. When I was in India, they rejected me. No one was interested. I came here. People responded. Now this is my home. So why are you taking me away? Why are you taking me from a place where people are really helping me to a place where no one wanted to help me? So there's a very poignant scene. And then Prabhupada, but when he went back to India, he realized what Krishna had in mind because when he went back, the whole country exploded in adulation and admiration and Prabhupada became practically the most famous person in the country. And that was Krishna's plan. But, you know, beware of unexpected consequences. Obviously, Prabhupada, that was Krishna's plan. It's, it's wonderful that it happened. It's not like, we're sorry that happened, but I could go step by step through, you know, very minute steps, 15 or 20 steps. I could show you how when Prabhupada went back to India, a process began, began which Prabhupada didn't intend. Prabhupada never called for it. He didn't want it. He didn't say we should do it. It just happened. And it was the Indianization of ISKCON. It was the Indianization of ISKCON. And so, and, the, and it, 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 it's still going. It actually hasn't stopped. Now again, I'm not saying, you know, there's something bad about India. There's nothing wrong with India. In fact, it's, you know, it's, it's the most fortunate country in the world in a sense because Krishna appeared there. What I'm saying though is, it's just like Prabhupada was in Delhi one time and it, some American devotees came and said, we found a place in center of Delhi where all the Americans and Europeans hang out. We can preach. Prabhupada said, if you want to preach to Americans, go to America. Obviously, like in America, there are three million people from a Hindu background, so obviously we should preach to them. But my point is that Prabhupada was very, very heavy on this point of reaching Western people in the Western world. He kept emphasizing this. Oh, I, I sat at his feet so many times and heard Prabhupada preach this. And so, the movement, and of course, as we know, in, when the war in Vietnam ended, and by, Richard Nixon ended it, when was that? Like, 72 or something. Anyway, the Vietnam War ended, and everything changed because people stopped protesting. They are basically trying to save their own necks. So people stopped protesting, the draft was abolished, the war was over, and people in the West went back to business as usual. In other words, making money and trying to enjoy. So if you look, Prabhupada actually never saw the Western world under normal circumstances. If you, Prabhupada visited the West between 1966 and 1976, approximately one decade. And if you look at that de decade, any historian will tell you it was a completely anomalous period of history. 
Everything changed. The Beatles went to Rishi Kesh. You know, whether it was Jimi Hendrix or, I mean, everyone. It was just, there were these gurus who were like super celebrities that could fill up football stadiums. All that's gone. It was a completely anomalous, abnormal time in history. And it's over. And Christians just sort of opened this window in history so the Prabhupada could come through. But it's over now. It's, it's really over. And so, um, I'm trying to get back to, or I, I'm fighting for, for Prabhupada, of course. I'm fighting for Prabhupada. And anyway, that's, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. I, I feel that, I actually didn't want to do this. I mean, Krishna West, I, by Krishna's mercy, I, you know, I, I'm able to afford it. I wanted to go to some nice, peaceful, beautiful place, just write books. I didn't want to get into all this. I actually prayed to Krishna many times, like, I'm sure you can find somebody else to do this. <laughs> or, and what I, what I kept feeling in my heart is that, um, that Krishna kept saying, no, you have to do it. And I kept thinking over and over and over again, if I see what's happened to Prabhupada's Western mission, and if I believe that I know what the problem is, and I also believe, you know, how it might be fixed. How will I face Prabhupada? How will I face him if I don't fight for this? How will I face him? What will I say to him when I leave this world? But getting back to your question, specifically, because your question is more like a detailed tactic, like it might be a good tactic to do that. Um, and, I mean, there's, I mean, your point is not unreasonable. It's just that, I guess, you know, right or wrong, I just decided that ultimately I have to take a stand for what I believe in. And when I go to temples, that I, I, you know, I, whenever, whenever I go to a, any ISKCON project, I respect their standards. And I, and I think I'm saying an example of cooperation, of mutual respect. So, again, it's, it's a judgment call, as they say. It's just... You know, I had to make a decision, and I thought about it, and that's what I did. So, there's, um, as you said, it dials up the heat a little bit. But um, it's also interesting that some people get so, so concerned about how you dress. <laughs> I mean, it's like, it's not like, does he love Krishna? Did he give a good class? Does he follow the principles? It's like, how is he dressed? I feel like I'm in Paris or something. Everyone's looking at how I dress. <laughs> yes. Um, is it right in my understanding that you are adjusting the preaching towards following Kala Desha Patra? So oh, yes. Time, place, and circumstances. Yeah. You know, if this fits the preaching in the West, then this is what we should do. Yeah, and Prabhupada urges us to do that. Yes. I've written papers that page after page of Prabhupada quotes where Prabhupada urges us to do this. Right. Urges us to do it. He doesn't just approve it, he urges it. One last quick example involving la France. <laughs> Il y a une Française ici. <laughs> <laughs> that um, when Tamal Krishna Goswami, my dear departed God brother, when Tamal Krishna Goswami went to China, he cut off his shikha, and he wore Western clothes and had actually had to sit, you know, around restaurants talking to people eating dog meat, which is very gross. So, and Prabhupada was delighted. Prabhupada celebrated what he did. And, and, and because he did that, because he did that, we have thousands and thousands of Chinese devotees. So now, I can eat, as I always say, sorry for all the, for some of you this is all rerun, but... But um, I can prove in a second that cultural barriers can be much more difficult than legal barriers. In China, there were very serious legal barriers to the Sankirtan movement. And yet, we have thousands of Chinese devotees. Take France. Désolé. In France, in France, there are no serious legal barriers to the Sankirtan movement. You know, they have every every set of national laws has its idiosyncrasies. But essentially, there are no 
real legal barriers to the Sankirtan movement, but there are very serious cultural barriers. There are very serious cultural barriers in France, which have to do with, I mean, I could go on for an hour giving you the historical circumstances and analysis and all that, going back a few centuries, but we don't have time. But anyway, and it's not just because French people are crazy. It's not like, oh, they're crazy, you know. No, it's, there's all kinds of serious historical circumstances. Marie, she's fine, she's normal. <laughs> <laughs> so, in France, there are serious cultural barriers, and the result, it's, you know, it's a disaster there. And I don't mean to, uh, how should I put it, uh, I want to appreciate that there are some really good, a few really good devotees there that are doing, you know, working very hard, and I, I don't want to neglect them or give the impression they're not good devotees, but, because they are. But the point is that here you have two countries, China and France, which proves that cultural barriers can be a hundred times, literally a hundred times more serious than legal barriers. And so if Prabhupada was delighted that Tamal Krishna did what he had to do in China, what about the co a country where the barriers are much higher, where it's a hundred times more difficult? Anyway, uh, thank you all very much for patiently listening to my uh, diatribe. And um, so now we'll proceed to the initiation. What's that? Shall I move forward? Yeah, ad advance, forward, yeah, come forward. <laughs> I guess you have to offer obeisance. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so now, in your own words, um, so what is it that you promise to do and not do? So I promise not to... I promise to follow the four regulated principles of uh, no meat eating, which includes fish and eggs, uh, no illicit sex, no intoxication, and no gambling. And I'm, I promise to chant a minimum of 16 rounds a day of the Maha Hare Krishna mantra. Very good. <laughs> That's that very good. Oh, the beads. Yes. Where are the beads? Oh, I'm about to chant one round now on your beads. So, um... I'll be with you shortly. <laughs> so everyone else that gets chant Hare Krishna or check your email or whatever. Better to chant. <laughs>
So, we're back on the air. Um, so, you, you got the right answers. <laughs> so, your name will be Narada. Oh. Hare Krishna. Thank you. You know who Narada is, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Someone mentioned that the other day and it kind of clicked. It was a little oh, good. Traveling, you see. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the festivals and things, so it's very applicable. So, like, thank you all for, for coming, and um, we have more programs, of course, today, tonight. So, I have to go do another program, right? <laughs> I mean, we're, we're, we're filming a little interview about Krishna West. It's a good thing I got all my histrionics out in this class so I can... <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you all very much, and hopefully we'll see you later. Prabhupada Gita. Yeah. 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 Yeah.